For those of you who are uh, tuning in uh, remotely, this is uh, the last of our um, open classroom focused sessions for this semester on hate crimes and um, ways of uh, reconciling or trying to reconcile uh, some of the um, racial and ethnic and religious issues that uh, America is grappling with uh, at this moment. Um, tonight, we're going to have two perspectives. Uh, one is a uh, national and global perspective um, uh, dealing uh, with um, what we think is going to happen moving forward. And uh, then we will also be talking from a local perspective on uh, the subject of uh, what the city of Boston itself uh, may uh, address over the coming years in dealing with uh, uh, reparations, which we talked about uh, last week. I'm going to turn the mic over to my colleague, Jonathan Kaufman, uh, head of our journalism program. Uh, who will introduce our speaker and uh, some of the uh, larger national and global issues. Jonathan? Thank you, Ted. Um, so um, we've talked the entire semester about various aspects of racism, anti-Semitism, uh, anti-Asian sentiment, um, uh, anti-Latino uh, or Hispanic sentiment. And one of the things that I think we've discovered is that these issues are incredibly complex. But I think we also know, certainly in the past few years, um, that they are not something that's limited to the classroom or to universities. Debates over race, uh, certainly, but also ethnicity and hate crimes are affecting kind of elections everywhere, certainly helped lead to the rise of Donald Trump. But as we're seeing uh, in more recent elections in Virginia and elsewhere, is also affecting um, local elections. So we wanted to end the semester by looking at the midterm elections uh, and also the 2024 election um, for a sense of how these issues may play out. Jo I'm thrilled to uh, have Joanna Weiss with us. Um, Joanna is a, a former reporter and critic um, at the Boston Globe. Uh, she's now a contributing editor to Politico, which means she gets to write really fun stories at the intersection of culture and politics. And she's also here at Northeastern um, in one of the Rare Jobs, uh, which is launching a startup magazine, which is uh, something that everyone thought was disappearing, but she's putting together a terrific magazine that's been coming out for a couple of years now uh, called Experience Magazine. And uh, it's online, but it's also uh, can be delivered to you on you know, really very impressive stock with great design, great articles. And um, she's really kind of using it to both showcase what Northeastern does, but also to engage in a lot of the issues that um, faculty think about and students think about. Oh, there you go. Um, so, um, but I, I, I wanted to bring her here to talk a little bit about, at this moment, if we look at, you know, we've been through the George Floyd summer, um, you know, we've been through various traumatic events for the country, but I'm wondering now, what does race and culture feel like and how will that or could that affect the midterms and 2024? I mean, Broadly, I would say it's just it's it's at the forefront of thought in a way that I think it it wasn't it certainly wasn't ten years ago you know and it maybe wasn't five years ago I mean I just think you know the it, it I may I'm I might date this current feeling back to Ferguson in terms of just the sense that there is you know a, a sense of growing protest and activism around a problem that was. Uh, Finally, that, that was not new, but was identified and named, and kind of sort of reached a critical mass of concern. And then, of course, with George Floyd, it, it just kind of you know it, it, it sort of bubbled over the top of the cup. And I it I think at this point it infuses so much of everything. I mean, so much of politics. You know, conversations about the economy, conversations certainly about criminal justice, which is a really complex issue that. You know the, the Democratic Party, in, in particular, is sort of grappling with change and how to message and sell change. Um, but I think it, it, you know, it, it infuses itself into the bills that Biden is passing. It infuses itself into infrastructure. It infuses itself into, um, you know, it's kind of every aspect of the political conversation. And I think it's also in the media has just been a much more front and center topic. 
education too, and we can talk about that. So everything. Um, it was interesting. We just had the student um, break into groups and uh, come up with strategies for the Republicans, for the Democrats, um, for Trump, for Biden, uh, and for the media and for the new Boston mayor in terms of how to deal with these issues politically. And what I thought was interesting was when we I was kind of writing down on the board while people were talking, um, the, the Biden group was basically didn't want to talk about race at all. They want to talk about economics, we're investing in you, these are universal programs. The group advising Michelle Wu said, don't use the R word, reparations, uh, but instead um, you know, talk about how free buses benefit lots of people, a housing plan can benefit lots of people. The Trump folks were like, critical race theory, uh, racism against white people, they're coming after you. Who's going to win that argument? Do you think, um, can we move away from the polarization or is the polarization just too attractive for the Republicans and for Trump? I mean, I think the Virginia gubernatorial election showed the power of, of using race as a, as a divisive force or using race as a, as a wedge issue. Um, the, so I think that that lesson has been learned or has certainly you know, has been celebrated on the on the right. Um, and uh, you know we can talk about the Virginia election. I don't know how much you've already I think gone through. People are pretty it. familiar. Great. So so the idea that that you know the I mean Terry McAuliffe was trying to talk about the economy, right? He was trying to talk about the things that he had done, but the the to be able, capturing the passion of suburban voters over this question of race. And this question of using race divisively, which is which is really sad, because again, if you take if you step back and take education as an as an issue, and you think about K through 12 education, I have kids in K through 12 public schools now. It's, it's, I, I think about it a lot, and our school system, like many in around the country, are grappling with how to teach race, and that's that's what happened again after George Floyd. It was this kind of like like the this, the the idea that this was something that we should. Exp explicitly be talking about and teaching in schools. And there's a very easy way to do it, to, to, to add to curricula, to add to reading lists, to add to a history curriculum that's not divisive at all. But politically, it gives you, you know, you, it, it is to the Republicans' advantage to focus on the divisive piece of it. And so I don't think they're going to let it go. You wrote early on about Ayanna Presley, um, and I think in a very prescient way. And she's often grouped with the squad, you know, AOC and Ilhan Omer and Talib. But, but I'm, I'm wondering if you have some sense whether even among progressives, there's some space emerging over how to deal with these issues. And, you know, I think everyone's assuming that Ayanna Presley will probably run for Senate at some point, um, and will have just a bigger and bigger focus. She is kind of local. But I'm wondering if, if, if she represents an approach to these issues which is maybe different than others on the left, and, and just what your sense was of her when you got to cover her. Yeah, I, I mean, I think she's an incredibly talented politician, and I think it is both to her advantage and to her disadvantage to be associated with the squad, right? It's, I mean, it's to her advantage because it gives her instant national notoriety and a platform and, a, a, you know, a, a headlines when she puts her name on something or when she says something. I mean, she has a louder voice than a, a what, second term, uh, than the most second term representatives from a small state might otherwise have. On the other hand, she gets painted with a broad brush and sometimes people make assumptions about what she stands for, what she believes that may or may not be true. She took actually a controversial stand uh, within the progressive base a couple of years ago when she voted against, there was like a, a, there was a bill or resolution to condemn BDS and she voted for the resolution and she got some pushback. BDS, if you just is, is, that's uh, a boycott, divest and sanction. It's a, it's a movement, a progressive movement uh, to boycott, divest and sanction the state uh, against the state of Israel in response to the treatment of Palestinians. And it's quite controversial. And it, 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 we could spend an hour talking about it pro and con. But it's, a, it's an issue that's popular with many progressives. And it's, uh, it's unpopular in some communities and among some of Ayanna's constituents. And she voted for that resolution and got pushback within the progressive community, but stood her ground. And again, it's, 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 it's a way that her, her position is more complex than, than 
just sort of you know being lockstep with three other people. So I I think you know again she has to get elected in Massachusetts, and if she's going to run statewide in Massachusetts, that's that's a much broader constituency than just her minority majority district in the city of Boston. So. And she has her own convictions and is a person who is never shy from standing up for her convictions. And that's, I think, separate from just electoral politics. So I think that she, I, 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 again, she's very eloquent and she's very good at using her voice. And so I suspect that she will continue to find ways to break through. And I'd be curious to hear her tr uh, if she does run for senator, if she does run for a statewide office at some point, talk about race, because she's very a compelling speaker and a compelling speaker about race, and to hear her messaging race to a broader community would be, I think, really compelling and interesting. I think sometimes just sometimes it's a matter, again, of the specific language that's used that that puts that 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 makes people who are let's let me be frank makes white people feel scolded or feel uh, you know uh, uh, blamed in a way that they don't necessarily want to be. And again, th these are these are complicated issues, and I've, I'm sh I know you've been talking about these all semester, so. Um, the idea of who, when you, you know, the, you talk about systemic racism, and to many people, it's, it's, it's a given, it's understand it, you know, look around you and you see what that means. There are other people who will look and say, well, I didn't personally do it, and so why, I, why should I be lumped into it? So there's, I think there's just a natural defensiveness among some people, and I think sometimes the language that that is very that within within academic communities and within progressive communities is just the just just the terminology that everyone uses can be a barrier when it gets out into the open world and i think that that's honestly something that democrats need to think about uh, is is you know uh, what what are the this is not a you know when you, for this is a separate from just race but when you talk about defund the police right there's a paragraph or six paragraphs of what you what people mean when they say that they don't actually mean they they most of them don't mean take all the funding away from police departments they mean let's look at how we're funding police departments and divert some of the the money that's going to law enforcement and instead use it toward mental health services community services it's really about reforming the police but you say defund the police and it and and someone at an, on another network in another newspaper could can take that and paint a broad picture of it and that that becomes kind of like the slogan and it means something but it, it, it means something different. So I think, you know, even a term like privilege, which again, when you're in a in an academic setting or you know and, and, and you can sort of think and talk about what that means, it's a very understandable term, right? Uh, you, I have the privilege of being able to go into a store and not worry that someone is gonna look at me funny and look at me like I don't belong, right? That's the, the, my my kid can play with a toy gun in his yard and not worry about the police thinking that he is a threat and doing something terrible, right? That's, that's the privilege we all live with. But some people hear privilege and say, well, I'm poor. I've struggled all my life. My parents, this is a, you know, a white person. I'm poor. I've struggled all my life. My parents struggled. Why are you calling me privilege? And then it's, it's, it's not the idea that's the challenge. It's the word that's the challenge. I'm, I'm curious, as uh, a person who's been involved with a number of different media platforms, um, what are the sources that you go to within the media uh, to get what you might consider to be a, a fair and objective view of uh, race relations, race issues, hate crimes at this point in the country? I mean, there are a couple different 
answers to that. I mean, one thing I do, and this is not this is this is not the fair and objective view, but I want to get a broad view. And so, one thing I do, and I recommend this to everybody as a matter of course, uh, you know, I drive home on my commute and I listen to the satellite radio and I toggle between MSNBC, CNN, and Fox News and NPR, and you get a very different sense of what's happening in the country not, and what's important and what is worth getting angry about when you listen to all of those networks. What is worth getting angry about on MSNBC is very different from what is worth getting angry about on Fox News. And I think to understand the country, you need to hear what people are being told to be angry about. And so you know, that's, that's, that's where you get an idea that, OK, this idea is a barrier. The, 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 you know, the, this is, this is uh, uh, something that's not being communicated or that's being manipulated. Uh, so I think, I think understanding how these stories are being told, because it's cer certainly on television, I don't think there really is a, a straight down the line news source. I really don't. I mean, I think. Um, I think we all know, you know, we all know where Fox News stands, and you know, right now there's some incredibly irresponsible stuff going on on Fox News regarding, particularly the January 6th election. I mean, we know where that stands. We know where MSNBC has sort of staked itself, and that was partly for ratings and financial stability. It was that it was to their financial interest to be kind of an, the opposite of Fox News, and they've done quite well. Um, and then, you know, CNN really has, I think an anti-Trump stance that is, and an anti-Trumpism stance that is palpable when you watch it. And I just, and, and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that everything, that, that, that there's not objective journalism to be done, but I think if someone who was a Fox News viewer looked at CNN, they would say, this is not, they're not telling my side of the story, they're not telling my story. Um, so I think, I think newspapers do a better job um, I think, um, but I, and I and I think there's some news magazines that do a better job. But again, I feel like you really need to read around. I feel, I feel like I feel like understanding the news today, when it comes to race and culture, is more is more like putting together a jigsaw puzzle than it is like finding the one source. Um, and this is kind of a, it's tied to race, but it's also tied to broader issues. There's a growing feeling I'm sensing among our faculty and, and certainly among columnists that, that the attack on democracy is serious and that we're dealing with Republicans who pose a threat which is different than, I don't like your policies, I'm going to sort of push in a certain way, um, but that it is undermining the foundations. And I think for the media, but also for the country, there is this question of, of how do we respond to that? I mean, can you think of a similar time when the country faced this kind of threat? And what, what can the media or, or people interested in these issues do about that? It, it, it feels like everyone is either being steamrolled by Fox or, as you say, with MSNBC, adopting the Fox playbook. And one reason, I think, why even newspapers like the Boston Globe or the New York Times are, are tilting leftward is because they're depending on readers now and readers are demanding certain things. And you know, I, I've always thought we had figured out in newspapers how to keep the business side and the advertisers away from us. And whenever a viewer or a reader was upset, we told them to write a letter and we didn't really care. That's changed now. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering if you feel the rules need to change yeah, it's such a challenging time for the media right now. And I do think that, you know, that, that a lot of the coverage is driven by a genuine sense that there is a threat to democracy. I mean, but reporting that bears out that there is a threat to democracy. So it's very difficult to blame news outlets for for overplaying and, and you know, or, and, or overplaying isn't even the right word, for, for giving substantial coverage to that issue, especially when, again, you have a network that's kind of promoting the, the idea of insurrection or promoting the idea of undermining the you know faith in elections. So again, I, I mean, my answer is always to to know and understand more. I think I think a, another big challenge that we haven't even brought up is social media, which again keeps people in their their confirmation bias bubbles and their filter bubbles, and so it's very easy to get a, you know. A, to be to be in a place where everything that you are reading and taking in confirms 
your ideas. And um, that makes it really hard to convince people who didn't think, who, who, who don't think the election results are valid, that they can trust a source that says otherwise. I mean, it's, it, it's and I'm not sure what, you know, that there was this, the, 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 the time when everyone, when there was this kind of illusion of objective journalism, that kind of Wa Ra Walter Cronkite era in what, the 50s, 60s, that was to some degree an anomaly too, right? I mean, historically, all the, there's a reason why there are all these newspapers out in the country, the, the Arkansas Democrat or the, you know, the something or other Republican, like, like a lot of these, a lot of old newspapers started out as partisan outlets that were created by a publisher who had a point of view that he, because it was almost always a he, wanted to express and built a newspaper around it. So there has always been partisan conflict. There's always been partisan media. And there have always been times when there have been very, very, you know, sharp, ugly disagreements. I mean, I think sometimes we're under this illusion that, that this is the worst time ever. And you can look back at many points in American history and say, wow, we've we've been through something like this before. So I don't know if that, that's, that's maybe cold comfort, but I do think, um, and, I, and, I, and I do think one, one nice thing to me about Trump being out of office is that the daily barrage of it feels like it's been less. I don't know if you feel that way too. I feel like, I feel like you can, there are other issues that rise to the forefront. You can be around your family and have a Thanksgiving dinner together again, thank goodness, and not feel like there's this giant, you know, cloud looming over the table that you either can or can't discuss. So I do, I, I think the absence of a super, super divisive figure who is dominating the news every second at least gives us some space to, to, to think, to reflect, to broach these issues in a better way. But I think one of the concerns there is, does that lower the temperature and the water's still boiling and we don't notice it. And there was a fascinating poll done recently about the Supreme Court argument um, on, uh, on abortion rights. And it basically reports that most Americans uh, support Roe versus Wade and they don't want to see it overturned, but it's not that much of a big deal to them, which it seems to me part of the genius of the conservatives and Republicans is to basically kind of have immense changes and consequential changes but now package them not in sort of Trump land where everything felt like an emergency, but more like, well, it's gonna be 15 weeks and then maybe it'll be six weeks. And you know, th there's a way in which I think what you're describing is true and we all welcome it, but I think there's gotta be concern among Democrats uh, to say, will we, you know, oh, I don't need to vote, I don't need to march, I don't need to give money because it's not as crazy as it was yeah. when Trump was here. I mean, I think the bigger thing that's happened on that front, honestly, is has happened on the electoral side, and I think that the right has done a very good job of, uh, you know, filling legislatures and in states that elect judges, judicial rosters with like-minded people, and that's where the change really comes from. I think that's one thing that we've learned is that a lot of these changes bubble up from the states, and it's and 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 the more state legislatures your party controls, the more state laws your party can control the more state attorney generals your party can control to, to, you know, to bring lawsuits. So I do think, um, you know, to get back to the idea of electoral politics, I think, I think a lesson for the Democrats has to be that you really have to focus on small ballot races, on state and local races, and on getting those ideas seated on the grassroots level and on the community level so that you can, so that change doesn't sort of, you know, Come, come up, come pop up from somewhere and, and alter the landscape completely for you. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, critical race theory was an issue that was driven as much as anything by local school boards mm -hmm. uh, and local parents groups as opposed to coming from uh, some major uh, uh, centralized national source. I mean, clearly President Trump was uh, 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 a driving force in that regard but it was neighborhood by neighborhood and school by school and then picked up nationally. I'm, you, you made an interesting point when you said that um, some of the major um, media outlets really seem to be about focusing who should, you should be angry with. Um, 
where does one turn if one doesn't want to be angry all the time? <laughs> you turn off cable news is the first thing you do. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> you just turn it off. Um, and you turn off Twitter because I think, again, you know, I was, I was just I was giving a talk on, on Twitter last week and I was doing some research and, it, and I was fascinated actually. Pew did in 2020 a survey of Twitter users and found that, let's see if I'm going to remember the stat correctly, 92% of the political tweets on Twitter were posted by 10% of the users. It's, it's this incredibly, and that's just the political tweets, like, it's this incredibly small group of angry people on both sides on Twitter who are driving the conversation. And it's actually, I think, a very distorted, if you're, if you're looking at Twitter to get a sense of the pulse of the electorate, you are getting a distorted sense. So I think you have to you have to either shut down those outlets or or look at those outlets very critically, uh, and I think again, um, it's just so to get back to kind of an earlier point. It's very it's 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 hard on a community level, but also essential on a community level to be able to have one on one conversations or close knit small group conversations because I think. I think the real thing that social media has done and that, and, and that television news has exploited is this idea that you're not looking at people eye to eye. You're looking at names and you're talking at names and you're talking at avatars and you're talking at screen names. And the temperature goes down, even if it's a divisive issue, the temperature tends to go down when you're looking at someone eye to eye. And you have to be polite to the person in the room and you don't want to hurt the person in the room, particularly if the person is your neighbor. Now, that's easier said than done, and I know people have cut off friendships, you know, because of these political divisive issues. But I feel like you got a better chance of breaking through that way. And, and where does Politico fit into all of this? <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> I mean, um, explain what Politico is and kind of sure its arc. But yeah, Politico is an online news outlet, and it was started by it started what. 12, 15 years ago, by two former Washington Post reporters. And really their innovation, their sort of genius at the time, and this was earlier days of the internet, was to, to really focus on the kind of horse race aspect of politics and to, and to they, they called it win the morning. They started the day with this really popular newsletter called Politico Playbook that was kind of your tip sheet on what to do every day. And they also really covered political news, congressional battles as they happen in the moment, very fast paced, and it was very much the like trans- sports almost. Like sports, like the transactional elements of politics. And they since added, uh, you know, the, the, they, they since added, um, what I write for is Politico Magazine, which is kind of a branch of them that's, that's much more about the long form issues and policy questions and personalities and, and cultural takes. So they have added elements that are much more you know, traditional, long-form journalism. But they still, a, a, a big part of the operation is still that kind of, you know, what's going on with the infrastructure bill today? What's Kristen Sinema saying? What's Joe Manchin saying? What's the squad saying? Who's doing this? What's Nancy Pelosi doing? It's, it's, it's like all the play-by-play the -play every moment. And it's gotten a lot of critique, I think, for, for focusing on that play-by-play that -play and gamesmanship aspect at the expense of some policy coverage. Um, I'm not, and, and I think it's also had some imitators. So, you know, I, again, I, I, I'll leave it to, to you to tell me whether, whether you, you think that the balance is a little better than it once was or what, or, or, or what effect you think it's had on the kind of broader news infrastructure. I mean, I think it's a sign of its power the same way, you know, we've had people, not this year, but in previous years, we've had somebody from Fox come to speak with us. And basically, he stood here and said, don't lecture me about Fox. Look at what MSNBC is doing. They basically learned from Fox, did the same thing, and kind of recovered their ratings. I think part of Politico was so successful that everyone does that now. I mean, the, the Washington Post would spin out these sections, the, you know, the New York Times, and also everyone basically does, I, was, I thought of you when I read this, they call it active viewing of television which is you watch a, a TV event, and it can be a debate, or it could be the Game of Thrones finale, or it could be anything, and people now watch while they're on Twitter. Right. And so every, it's, it's this kind of bizarre, interactive thing. You don't, I mean, you don't just sit there and then write what you think. You're actually saying it kind of 
along the way. And, and that, I think, may be moving even more, raises questions about how Google and all this stuff is changing our brains, the kind of fast twitch um, response is, is there. Um, I wanted to open it up to, to questions with the students, but while they think of them, I want to ask you one, one, one other question, which is the discussion about race with George Floyd, you know, as you say, became something everyone engaged in. But it strikes me a little bit, and maybe I'm talking just from a journalism perspective, but I, I think it's wider. The Me Too discussion seems to have dropped a little bit. Um, that, you know, there were all these discussions of Me Too and gender and in the media and politics kind of everywhere, the Academy Awards even. George Floyd came along and, you know, maybe Americans can only keep one injustice in their brains at one time. <laughs> but I, I wonder if you've sensed that and whether, and sort of what that says, um, are the issues that have, are facing women kind of just been pushed aside because we got to deal with the people of color right now? I have, I have sensed that Me Too is, has definitely dropped out of the daily conversation. I do think it's partly that the media can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Like it really, it, I, I do think that that's a, a valid critique. Um, I. And you know, it, Me Too bubbles up. I mean, it bubbled up with with Andrew Cuomo and with Chris Cuomo. Like, I think that there. I, I think I think maybe there's a natural evolution to a movement like like Me Too, and maybe this will happen with the post George Floyd movement as well. Where where and, and this is this was kind of the hope for Me Too, right? That it changes the ground rules and it changes ex everyone's expectations. So the good news about the Andrew Cuomo story is that behavior that maybe. 15 years ago, he knew he could get away with because that was just how politicians acted, is now considered unacceptable. And it's just a ground rule, basic understanding that that's unacceptable. And there was no one besides his brother, who was a CNN anchor, who was rushing to his defense. And so in that sense, I think you can say that Me Too won, Me Too succeeded. And we, you know, even though we don't, even if we're not pointing out an injustice every minute, when a glaring injustice comes up, everyone is now on the same page about it. And if that can happen with other issues, then, then, then that's great. So I, I, I'm hoping that it's good news. OK, great. Um, any questions uh, about media, about politics? Or comments. Or comments. Yeah. Emma's going to come by with the microphone. Hi. Well, thanks. First of all, thank you so much for talking to us today um, and for all of your insight and expertise. I come from an anthropology background, um, which is looking at like the work of ethnography and kind of looking at people's cultural background. But often anthropology and I, ethnographies for my like position as a student can tend to be very exploitative and aren't necessarily capturing the whole stories. You mentioned a little bit that you work with culture. When it comes to kind of creating larger stories and kind of your work as a journalist, what are your like do you have any tips and tricks or like ways of looking at it so that you are capturing people's whole, whole stories or really like contextualizing culturally the work that you're doing? Yeah. And, um, as, a, and as a magazine editor, right? Because you're Yeah. Now. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, you know, right. And, and as an editor, I would say the piece of that is just to be very, very conscious of where the stories are coming from and making sure, I mean, we're, you know, we, we experience magazine is, is really global in scope and we really want to make sure that in terms of subject matter, in terms of, of the journalists, the, the, the writers and the illustrators that we hire, that, that you, in, and in terms of the origin of the story that we're capturing, you know, a broad, a, 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 as, as broad a population as we can. Um, I also think, and again, you know, what, one of the things that has always helped me as a journalist, one of the most formative things that happened to me was I grew up in the Northeast and I went to college up in Boston. And then the first thing I did when I um, graduated from college was move down to New Orleans where I'd never been before. And I was hired as, as a reporter. I was, I think I was a summer intern and then I loved it so much that I was like, please hire me. And at the end of the summer, I got on staff at the Times-Picayune. And it was just, it was, a, it was five years of intense education that was probably more valuable to me than my college education in terms of just Another, a, a new culture, a different part of the country. My job was to go around and talk to people of all races and political backgrounds because story by story you were encountering a different group. And it really gave me a completely, a, a, a new, a perspective on the country that I carry with me every single day. And so when an issue, 
like abortion or gun control comes up, I, I feel like I, wherever I personally stand on the issue, I feel like having spoken to enough people on all sides, I understand where people are coming from and to be able to kind of start from that perspective of like, you know, I may, I may vigorously disagree with this person, but I know, I understand the underpinnings of this person's values and ideas that bring them to this position that might be opposite of me. And it's a, it's a generous way of looking at issues and it's sometimes an uncomfortable way of looking at issues, um, but, I, but I find it a personally valuable one. Thank you. Let me ask you though, do, do you find that as an anthropologist or studying anthropology, studying anthropology. <laughs> that, your, that your race or your privilege or your parts of your background make people look at you skeptically or make you look at yourself skeptically? And does that shape where you look and what you look for? So I feel like that's a conversation I have a lot of my classes of like, where are you transplanting yourself? Like when, when is it okay to transplant yourself or write on things that don't directly affect you? And so, I mean, like, I, like I'm studying anthropology, I'm not an anthropologist. Um, I very much tend to focus on like queer issues and try to like bring in other voices whenever I am doing work that is in a, in a community that's not my own, but I have tried to focus on issues that are my own so that I don't feel that sense of like taking from a community I'm not a part of. So that's kind of was part of my question of like, where do you make sure you're not misinterpreting? But obviously it's in, in all of my, like it's impossible to completely leave your own bias at the door. So I think almost acknowledging it at the start of the work is important and then continuing to check, but it's never going to be without. Because let me ask you about this because we both come from sort of traditional journalism backgrounds where in fact the whole point often is that you're parachuting into a community that's not your own and making judgments if you're lucky within 12 hours um, and putting it out there to you know potentially millions of viewers or listeners or readers and then disappearing right yeah. and and with no accountability is that model broken or is there some value to that model i it's not a great model to be honest it's not a great model and i mean you know in a in a very like like here's a here's a very light frivolous way to look at it. I you know again I used to live in New Orleans and any time that anyone from outside New Orleans like from the New York from some newspaper outside New Orleans parachuted in to write a story about something that was happening in New Orleans, serious or humorous, whatever the issue was, they always put in some reference to jambalaya. You know, or like, it was like come on, you know, like like like, like they're. And, and, and if you're local, you read, a, you, you read a story like that. It happens with stories from Boston. There are people who will come in and, and make up neighborhoods in Boston that don't exist, but they just, you know, like, didn't the Times call something, call South Boston Sobo or something? It was like, some, you know, these absurd things happen, and if you are local, you are very, you are acutely aware and, and frankly, very insulted by someone coming in and purporting to understand you in in 12 or 24 hours. And again, I say that as someone who has done those kinds of stories in the past, because you're right, you work for a, a traditional newspaper and that's sometimes your job. So I think, I, th I think um, you, you, you come at your field with a lot of wisdom already, which is impressive. And I think that, that, that to, be, to be aware that that's a danger of what you're doing, I think is part of the battle, right, to understand to, to, to understand that when you are coming into a community that's not your own, that, you, that, 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 that it is impossible, in fact, for you to get a full understanding of it and to be able to, to kind of acknowledge that and, and be generous about that in your work, I think will help your work. We, we are, in fact, uh, in Boston, um, and uh, we have a group of folks who have worked on Boston who um, are available to us um, online, so I want to cut to them, and then uh, if we can, we'll 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 get back to this. Um, I, I want to start with uh, April Innes, who is uh, part of uh, King Boston. She conducts their research, um, and uh, April came to us uh, at the School of Public Policy, uh, hoping to uh, be able to work with a group of students on an issue that they are working on uh, with uh, the city, and that is to say, uh, particularly with the new mayor uh, coming uh, in, if there were to be a discussion of reparations or ways of uh, 
overcoming the uh, racial disparities uh, that existed in the city. One, how would you operationalize that conversation? Um, and two, how would you prioritize the uh, subjects and issues that might be uh, brought to the forefront? So uh, I'm going to ask April, who um, I think had some difficulty figuring out. Uh, yes, she's shaking her head. Um, uh, April had some. She April's in a car, and has had yes. some difficulty uh, parking. Um, so maybe we can adjust the lights down a little bit, and we'll hear from April in terms of what it is um, that she and King Boston uh, have looked for, and what it is that King Boston does as a community-based organization uh, within Boston. So April, you're on. Ah, great. Thank you so much, Professor Landsmark, and for all of you that pressed your way out tonight, I apologize, I'm in my car. Um, I'm not the best direction driver or, um, you know, impromptu parking finder, <laughs> parking space finder, but um, I'm, I'm glad that you all were able to patch me in. Um, but more than anything, I'm really honored to present this, this uh, work. Um, these students were awesome and diligent in partnering with us. Um, but, but first, I just want to quickly introduce myself, and then I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about um, our organization, and I'm going to share our land acknowledgement with you. So as Professor Landmark said, my name is um, April Innes. I am the Director of Community Engaged Research at King Boston. And King Boston is an anti-racism nonprofit that works in deep partnership um, with the city of Boston. We were founded when this proposal had arisen within the Boston Foundation to, to um, fund a, a permanent memorial on the Boston Common called the Embrace. And this memorial is intended to honor the legacies of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his wife Coretta Scott King and their time here together in Boston. And I'm excited to share that the Embrace Memorial um, is slated to land on the common um, around this time next year. So King Boston as an organization, we're envisioning and working towards um, a radically inclusive um, and equitable Boston that's really worthy of us all and where um, BIPOC in particular thrive. And what I mean by BIPOC, BIPOC is, um, for, for those of you who are not familiar, it stands for Black and Indigenous and People of Color. Um, so where BIPOC folks can also thrive and um, we do this work grounded in, in love, joy, and well-being. Um, so in this effort to really dismantle systemic racism, um, we've developed a theory of change that has three key components. So one of them is culture and arts, and that's where the Embrace Memorial comes in and all of the programming that's out of that. Um, the, the second is community organizing. And then the third is, is uh, research, which is um, where I live and where my work lives. And so this work around reparations um, really brings into um, the latter two parts of the theory of change that I mentioned, community organizing, as well as, of course, the research. Because the purpose of this report is to really um, draw a clear through line from the historical policies and practices, particularly those sanctioned by the city of Boston or the state of Massachusetts. Um, so to kind of identify those, document those, and then connect those where possible to the disparities, the racial disparities and inequities that we're witnessing today. Um, so I'm really proud to introduce this work and to share our um, land acknowledgement, which I will on the next slide. Thank you. So um, as we start today, we'd like to acknowledge and recognize a fundamental truth. In Boston, we are gathered on the ancestral and unceded land of the Pawtucket and Massachusetts, um, whose land has been stolen and language lost due to colonization, disease, and forced dispersal. Their descendants continue to steward this land, and may we find ways in our work for justice and equity to center the decolonization of the Pawtucket, Massachusetts, Nipmuc, Wampanoag, and all indigenous peoples around the world. And as we cannot gather in person, well, in this case, me, um, I'd like to invite all of you, nevertheless, to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technology, structures, and ways of thinking that we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities, so I invite you to join me in also acknowledging all this 
as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. So um, I said earlier that I was proud to present this work, but I'm even more proud to present or rather introduce the, the illustrious team of students who really labored with us and, and poured their heart out in this work. Um, and really paid careful um, attention to details and also the storytelling elements that are important to, to this report and how it's presented. Um, and those students are um, Claudia Capria, Haley D'Amico, and Samantha Kanika. So with that, I'll hand it over to them and thank you all for your um, patience and grace this evening. So hi, everyone. Um, that was our land acknowledgement. Thank you, April, for the introductions. The issue today, the specific issue at hand is reparations for Black Americans. And NCOBRA, which is the National Coalition of Black for Reparations in America, and NAARC, which is the National African American Reparations Commission, set the foundational work for which this project is based. Now, per NCOBRA, the definition of reparations is the process of repairing, healing, and restoring a people who were injured due to their group identity in violation of their um, fundamental human rights by a government, corporation, institution, or individual. It is with this definition that King Boston began their work. Boston as a city is not exempt from America's leg legacy of slavery and has benefited greatly from the exploitation, genocide, and the legislative processes that have hindered Black Americans since this country's colonization. Um, so using historical context, quantitative and qualitative data, as well as modern stories, the need for reparations in Boston has become clear. Building off of that definition, um, moving forward with the work that we were doing this semester on our project and with King Boston, um, King Boston really did a great job of sort of handing us uh, the specific areas that we should be looking at, that they've sort of taken what Ann Cobra had to say and outlined seven areas that were more specific to our um, to, to Boston's history, to the experience of being a black resident of this city and outlining them here. So you can see them on the screen, housing, transportation and infrastructure, culture and symbols, income and wealth, the criminal legal system, education and health and access to healthcare. Uh, we also worked with two other students of another university who are actually PhD candidates who couldn't join us here tonight. Um, so for the context of this presentation, um, the other two students were the ones who really dove into the education and the health side of things. So we'll focus on the other five injury areas and what we found in our research. Um, but in addition to really combing through that history, we wanted to find um, as much data and background as we could from historical context, also from um, lived experience, from what's current in the news, um, what we could find in academic research, piling all that together, and then looking a little more um, forward and modern at three case studies. So we looked at Amherst, Evanston, and Asheville as cities in the country that have already approved a reparations plan and are in the process of unfolding that and trying to learn vicariously through their experience. So with that, we will begin with the case studies. So for an order to Boston to successfully implement local reparations, it was kind of important to look at previous locales who, have, who are in the process of reparations legislation or who have already implemented registration uh, reparations within their respective communities. So Amherst, Massachusetts is one town that has begun the legislative process and Boston representatives can use this process kind of as a foundation and a guideline to see what works and what doesn't. So in Amherst, uh, members of the town started a pet petition for reparations following the events of summer 2020, specifically the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmed Aubrey, as a way to actively better the lives of the Black community within Amherst itself. So the petition gained traction and actually got support from three town councilors, and it eventually made its, uh, became a resolution that made its way to town council. The resolution included a historical timeline with a detailed description of the harms done to the Black community since the town's conception more than 260 years ago. Um, the formal resolution acknowledges Massachusetts as the first colony to legalize slavery, that several historical Amherst residents owned enslaved peoples or supported slavery, and that the town ordered that the 
the first free black people needed to leave the town in 1762. This was further in uh, further showed in the 1950s when segregation still existed within the town. And then so much so that as far in as 2019, the wealth gap between black residents and white residents was still ex especially disparaging. Um, but the resolution concluded with a formal apology in recognition of these harms that were done and a pro proposition for the creation and implementation of a local commission to conduct studies and research on what local reparations could look like and make informed, uh, make informed recommendations. Uh, lessons Boston, sorry, could take from this process would be to listen to locals specifically and to make sure black Bostonians are actively involved in the decisions of what reparations will look like in Boston. Sorry. So the case study I focused on was Evanston, Illinois, which is actually the first city in the United States to go through the reparations process for its residents. Um, back in 2019, Evanston actually established a reparations subcommittee, which designated $10 million from its municipal cannabis retailers occupation tax to support reparations in both housing and economic development. And then this year in 2021, Evanston actually began the first part of the reparations process, which includes an initial amount of $400,000 towards their housing initiative called the program. And under this, 16 of its Black residents are to be selected to receive $25,000 that they can then put towards either home ownership, home improvements, or mortgage assistance. Um, and the purpose of this resolution is to not only acknowledge the prejudiced opportunity, um, sorry, the prejudiced housing policies working against Evanston's Black residents, but to create more opportunities for either housing development, ownership, economic growth, and equity within its Black communities. Um, and although this initiative does look very hopeful on the surface, Evanston actually received a lot of backlash, especially, especially for using the term reparations. Many critics claimed that simply selecting only 16 individuals in a city that has thousands of black residents is hardly considered reparations. And additionally, many people believed that the reparations process should have been determined by the people themselves and not by the city. So moving forward, it is very important for Boston and its new mayor to pay attention to the efforts carried out by Evanston, as well as the backlash they received for when it comes time for Boston to actually start their own reparations process. And the final city that was considered for their work on reparations was Asheville. Um, so this began in June of 2020 when they had a unanimous city council vote to approve a reparations bill they were the first city in the South to approve a reparations plan. And at the time, only the second in the nation that had already designated funds to their project. And that funding came uh, from the sale of an unused public building that had actually been taken by eminent domain in the 1970s during that era of urban renewal. So at that time, that was the process of reconstructing the city that resulted in mass gentrification, um, cost the black community their homes, their businesses, their local history, their local culture. Um, so this in itself was uh, brought out the skeptics in this reparations process because it was already, you know, turning that land around for the money. And some of the money from the sale was earmarked for other projects, but the largest chunk of it, this uh, $2.1 million fund was put into this reparations uh, initiative. So because housing and home ownership is a proven contributor to building wealth and building generational wealth, the goal of the city was to take that money and their reparations plan was entirely focused on avenues for black citizens to attain home ownership. So similar to Evanston, there were a lot of critics of this. Um, they cited it as being piecemeal that it was a publicity stunt, just trying to garner more attention for the city, get people talking about them on a national scale. And the argument, the same argument as in other places was that this shouldn't even be called reparations if it's only addressing one of the several injury areas that are nationally defined. Um, the effort doesn't provide direct payments to black residents. It doesn't address the other issues in you know, considering the scope of their lives. So. The other issue is that because the funding pool was $2.1 million, 
$2.1 million might sound like a lot on paper, but in terms of giving people access to quality housing and buying homes, 2.1 million dries up very fast. Um, so it felt like a, a good place to start, but the funds don't have any promise for a future endeavor. There's no continued funding. Um, they really marketed this to the community for the fact that it wasn't going to affect how taxpayers were helping to, to fund the initiative. But at the same time, there's no promise for how this program will continue to evolve in the future. So considering what they've done well, um, unlike Evanston, they did, uh, they hired a third party consultant. The city said, we're not even going to try to handle reparations. We're gonna bring someone else in that can look at this and take care of it for us. They also had a high level of community involvement, um, really boosting public opinion of the whole process because they sent surveys directly to black residents, asking them to have a say in how they wanted to see this project unfold, how the money should be spent. And even in putting together the committee that's going to handle this long-term, the committee is going to be comprised 50% of nominated community members through the use of that survey. And the other 50% will be professionals from fields involved in the project, such as you know contractors, people with ex uh, expert technical um, experience, things like that. So in the context of our report, these case studies, they all serve as important models for exploring how to even begin the reparations process. And there's a lot that can be learned as each of these cities continues to unfold their stories, experiences, and what has and hasn't worked. So moving on from that, another key part of our report was documenting harm specifically in Boston. Um, so the first one up would be culture and symbols, and that refers to the destruction and the subsequent loss of African people's culture as a result of slavery, Jim Crow, and modern discrimination. Uh, this section researched the harms brought in by the resulting erasure of art, music, and creative opportunities in Boston specifically. Uh, the framework that this was observed under followed the thesis that Black art is often only accepted and shown when it fits in within a white institution's agenda and lens of acceptability. And historically, this was revealed in the lack of data about Black art history, not only in Boston, um, but nationwide. And it was further proven by Bostonian institutions such as the Museum of Fine Arts and their focus on Eurocentric male artists specifically, as well as specific cases of racism against Black visitors. Um, art schools in Boston, which are a very large signifier of modern Boston culture um, are predominantly taught by white instructors with white students, which perpetuates a, a specific lens within the culture of Boston. Um, and even further than that, of the 80 statues and monuments that are in Boston, only eight pertain to black figures and black history. Um, and of those eight, one of them has since been removed for a, a blatantly racist overtone and another one is currently under fire for a similar overtone. And almost all of them are placed in remote areas that aren't traditionally walked. Um, and from this, it can be concluded that black art and artists are too often only accepted under the white institution's approval or their lens and that black people in general are underrepresented in Boston's cultural scene. So, to kind of improve that and our recommendations for Boston to kind of begin the process of rectifying this, um, we would say that they need to fund black art and artists specifically for more than just diversity exhibits because too often black artists are only shown as kind of during black history month or when they wanna say like, look at this one thing that we did to promote diversity and then that's it for the rest of the year. Um, additionally, to commission more public art installations by black artists as opposed to by white ones. And to commemorate Black history, specifically Black history in Boston, in Black spaces that are owned and created by Black people. Um, the next injury area is income and wealth. And income and wealth disparities can be defined and understood um, by Black history in America, but also within the parameters of capitalism. And in the broadest context, the income and generational wealth disparities are a nationwide affliction. Um, with the understanding of capitalism and that capital ultimately creates power, it is also really important to note the impacts of slavery on the modern day economy and how that ultimately drives the current racial disparities in wealth and income. Um, Boston specifically is a significant place where this can be seen, particularly in light of a 2015 report uh, 
that show the average white person's net worth in Boston is $200,000 and the average black person's net worth is eight. Not 8,000, not 800, but $8. Um, and this is a direct result of you know, previous enslavement, the beginnings, and, and which started the beginnings of generational poverty. Um, and then furthered by Jim Crow laws and segregation, which prevented black people from fully participating in not only Boston's economy, but the nationwide economy. Um, this pertains and shows up in Boston specifically with the plunder of black wealth in Boston, the distinct lack of funding uh, towards black businesses and the gap of, uh, the gap between the number of black owned businesses and white owned businesses, as well as overall employment in the city. As you can see from this chart, um, black business owners are still facing pretty significant financial barriers. Um, of the $2 billion that Boston had in contract money, less than half a percent was given to black businesses, approximately 9 million, which equals to 0.4%. Um, and further, black people in Boston are significantly less likely to own homes. And if they do, they are far more likely to be in mortgage debt and non-white households are significantly more likely to have student loans and medical debt, which contributes uh, to the decline in net worth. Um, it is also really important to note the implications of general wealth on household income because inheritance bequests and intrafamilial, intrafamilial transfers are actually the largest drivers of the racial wealth gap, um, more than any demographic or socioeconomic factor. Um, and this specifically ties back to our original statement relating to capital as power, no matter the advancements of one individual, it really doesn't compare to you know, old money and generational power. And as such, recommendations to begin the process of rectifying this disparity would be direct payments to Black Bostonians and not just one-time payments, but multiple to kind of assist in the generations of wealth withholding as well as much larger efforts to increase black home, land and business ownership through loan forgiveness programs or through startup grants. So the injury area that I focused on was criminal legal, where I examined you know, what aspects of the criminal justice system in both Boston and the rest of the United States have contributed to the discrimination and prejudices against black individuals. You know, what has put them in the position they are today where they're still fighting for equity and equal representation in a system that's actually working against them. There have been quite a few historical policies that have contributed to their oppression in the current system. For example, the very first police force was actually established in Boston, but it was based on a concept of slave patrols and watchmen. Following this, we then saw a new era of slave codes, which we all know as Jim Crow laws. This not only increased the amount of police, police officers, but allowed them to de develop even harsher tactics. We also saw President Lyndon B. Johnson implement his infamous war on crime, which not only placed military grade weapons into the hands of police officers, but also physically placed more officers in black communities. So since the very beginning, the idea of policing has been focused on the criminalization and over policing of black people. As we can see in this chart, African-Americans made up nearly 20% of all arrests made in Massachusetts in 2020, even though they make up less than 10% of the entire population. And similarly, we saw that in Boston, which had 4,000 arrests in 2020, while 2,300 or nearly 60% of them were African-American, despite them making up only 25% of the city's population. And these dis disproportionate arrest rates stem from policies such as Richard Nixon's war on drugs, which to this day makes a black individual nearly four times more likely to be arrested for marijuana related offenses than whites. This is despite numerous studies which have actually shown that the possession and use of the drug is nearly the same between black and white populations. In 2008, Massachusetts actually decriminalized marijuana, which brought a sort of renewed hope in Boston to hopefully finally right some of its past wrongdoings and marijuana related arrests within its black communities. Um, programs were created like the social equity program and the economic empowerment program that were implemented in the state with the intention to support those who have been previously affected by these disproportionate arrest rates and cannabis prohibition. And then following the decriminalization, we saw newly passed legislation that allowed for the opening of dispensaries 
However, this ended up bringing about an abundance of new issues due to black individuals struggling to even get licensing for these dispensaries. The Cannabis Control Commission actually reported this year that out of 18,000 individuals in Massachusetts who have received these licenses, only about a thousand of them, or not even 6%, are black. And most of the struggles that these black individuals have been faced with are things like high fees, zoning issues, and the real estate process in their cities. So it's obvious that the group of people who have been the most criminalized and over-policed for marijuana are still the ones suffering due to a drug that's not even criminalized anymore. Other things that place Boston's black communities at a disadvantage are Boston's primarily white police force, which is 65% white, even though whites only make up 45% of the city, and as well as the Cory system. And although Cory has gone through several different reforms, most recently in 2018, there are still limitations to it that are affecting the ability of these individuals to get jobs, apply for housing, and any other occupational licenses. So although there are a lot of differences in opinions surrounding what possible recommendations should look like, it's important to start community conversations about the possibilities of redress within Boston's criminal justice system. Some recommendations include diversifying Boston's police department. As a recent study that was actually conducted in Chicago showed that the diversification could potentially alter interactions between police and individuals in those communities. The data yielded from this study actually showed that when black and white officers were faced with comparable working conditions, black officers were making 15 fewer stops and nearly two fewer arrests. On top of that, efforts should be made to engage the the city in community policing, which means having open dialogue between residents of Boston, the police department, and other officials. Taking this step could also push Boston towards fighting for police accountability. The new mayor should also consider expanding Cory to better include those who have been criminalized by the system and potentially conducting research alongside Boston's academic institutions to better understand how interactions with the police impact the rest of the community. To understand the experience of housing for Black residents of Boston, the context of our report covered a timeline of the last century and all of the events that took place during that time, in addition to what are some modern day struggles in, in the housing experience. So um, looking through Boston's history, beginning in 1917, when the Supreme Court deemed that it was unconstitutional for the city itself to segregate housing, Although as I say that, I, it sounds like I'm saying that was a Boston specific problem, but this was nationwide as they deemed it unconstitutional. Um, this led to the rise of covenant use, which was the practice where a landowner could write into their property deed that they were prohibiting the sale of their property from ever being sold to a non-white buyer. So this became a very common practice in the entire greater Boston area including um, the first, what would be considered housing development in Massachusetts was in greater Boston where one person with a large plot of land had basically designed their own neighborhood and made it exclusive to white only families. And even in modern day, this practice was so ingrained um, in, in white property ownership that deeds are still uncovered that include this language, that this property has been turned over over the years and it's never been caught and, until someone finally notices that technically you still can't buy this home if you're a black home buyer. Um, out of that practice was born codes of ethics by real estate agencies where they would refuse to sell to a non-white family if it was a neighborhood that was exclusively white their code of ethics would be posted right on the window to the agency's location in the Boston area, stating that it was not their responsibility to introduce a new race into an established neighborhood. Uh, then out of the Great Depression came the National Homeowners Loan Corporation, uh, which was founded with the goal to create city maps nationwide that would assess neighborhood values with the intention of offering guidance to mortgage lenders so that they could assess risk in giving money to potential home buyers, but the criteria that was mainly used to determine a neighborhood's value was the number of black families who lived there. The city maps outlined these neighborhoods with terms like 
still desirable to least desirable to hazardous being marked, which is shown here on the slide in bright red, which was designed to deter lenders from offering anyone money to purchase a home in that area. It not only stops people from being able to buy a home, but also from being able to buy a home that would otherwise be renovated or become multiple units and it restricts the amount of housing that can take place there. So the neighborhood's worth um, fell into the, this practice of redlining and determined the value of homes by how many black families were residing in the neighborhood and lowering property values just for that reason. So these were nationwide practices, um, but in Boston specifically, the history of the city has shown a lot of inaction on the part of leadership to do anything about the discrimination and the segregation that was persisting. Uh, modern day practices might not seem as overt, but the legacy of these former practices remain. In a study as recent as 2020 by Suffolk University, they shed light on bias that still occurs in rentals in the Boston area. They put together a group of participants through Greater Boston to test the effects of race and source of income on the housing market by taking their pool of participants and trying to view available apartments. So what they found were that the white participants were able to view 80% of available units, whereas the black participants were only able to view 48%. And then in a third group, they simulated low income renters of both races um, as renters who would be renting with a housing voucher. And they were only able to view 20% of available apartments, regardless of race. So these results really highlighted the ongoing discrimination in the Boston housing market based on race and income. And whether it's overt or unconscious bias, it shows the substantial impact that's still had on the lives of Boston residents. More modern practices also include zoning laws, they're seen as another tool in modern segregation um, because they're enacted by each municipality on an individual basis and can end up preventing black families from being able to move out of these lowest income areas in greater Boston that still today reflect this original map of redlining. So in suburbs where there's access to stronger public education um, and other great resources, there's a limit on how much low income housing can actually be constructed there, even if there is ample land available for that use. There's already state legislation that exists to help bridge that gap between available land and the ability to build housing. So chapter 40B, um, which has been around for quite a while, outlines a threshold of only 10% of residences that must qualify as affordable housing in each municipality. If the community is below 10%, then construction of low-income homes can bypass local zoning laws as long as the proposed construction is 20 to 25% affordable housing. And as of today, only 30% of greater Boston cities actually meet the 10% threshold. In their entire towns, only 10% of their housing is considered affordable. And so Chapter 40R even gives a monetary incentive as direct payments to the city to reduce the cost of even building affordable housing. Under the eligibility guidelines, the construction doesn't even have to be solely affordable housing. It can be mixed use so that it's part um, low income units, part full income um, priced units. It can even be part um, business, there can be storefronts, there can be office spaces. They're really trying to encourage communities to take advantage of these programs. And what we've found in, in as of the 2019 Greater Boston Housing Report Card, um, which is a very interesting read if anyone has the time to flip through, um, but a lot of areas really haven't taken advantage of these programs, except for you know, proposals that were already on the table before these, these chapters 40B um, and 40R went into effect. And so it helped streamline some projects, but hasn't really encouraged the construction of, of further affordable housing in the areas that needed the most. So moving on to transportation and infrastructure, which ties very strongly into a lot of the concerns with housing. Um, in Boston, the infrastructure really shows the lasting harmful effects 
that all of these discriminatory practices over the years have had on the black community. So the history of highway construction in particular, there's a graphic here that shows you a before and after of the same neighborhood where homes were completely leveled for the sake of bringing in this infrastructure um, through predominantly black neighborhoods. And what ends up happening is when the highway is built, there's a physical barrier between what existed of a black neighborhood and what's on the other side of the highway. So with a physical barrier in between you and a grocery store or your home and your doctor's office, what's been found is that um, a lot of these low income neighborhoods don't even have private vehicles. This is a constant reminder of the wealth that they can't attain, the transportation that they don't have access to, and now the physical barrier that's been created around their neighborhood by this structure that they don't even utilize. So today, the neighborhoods that continue to line the existing highways face problems associated with high levels of pollution that come from highway traffic. They have lower property values because of their proximity to the highway. And as I mentioned, many of these residents don't even own a car. So the highway that cuts through their home just reminds them every day about how racist of a practice it was to design these modes of travel that are meant to create ease of access for an affluent white community and harm the black community. So in a recommendation for this particular injury area, um, because of the strong ties between housing and infrastructure, improving the quality of each helps fuel the other. Improving um, housing encourages more neighborhood development, brings in new businesses, brings in new employment opportunities, and lends to the wealth building of that area. So in housing, as I mentioned, there is space in the suburbs to continue expanding on affordable housing. But on the flip side of that, it's equally important to think about revitalizing the existing neighborhoods, bringing in resources, businesses, um, you know, really helping build the value of existing neighborhoods where the Black community already lives. Of course, the historical problem with this, um, just as in the example of our case studies with urban renewal, is that in previous efforts to rebuild a neighborhood, we see gentrification. We see Black families um, being priced out of their own neighborhoods because it's working on improving. Um, on the next slide, please. Studies of public transport. Oh, I'm sorry. Did we miss one? Oh, no, I sorry. think this is the last slide. No, you're good. All right. One last thought on um, uh, before we go into conclusions, the last thought on transportation is also that uh, in public transit, a lot of studies have shown that a lot of the Black and Latinx populations are primarily reliant on bus transportation which receives the least amount of funding, funding from federal, state, and local levels. Um, the MBTA has long been under fire for aging cars and tracks. Um, with the rail system, inconsistency in service, inefficient routes, but uh, they've also historically done away with modes of public transit that were commonly used by the Black community, like the elevated rail, and they replaced them with more train um, routes that really just connect the center of the city to the suburb so that people who already have cars and private transportation have another convenient mode of access into the city, but it's still not ease of access for the black community who's reliant more on walking, biking and busing. Um, there is, uh, I'll just mention this briefly for the sake of time, but in our recommendations in the report, we talk about the Go Boston 30, which is a current city initiative where they've outlined this overwhelming need to revamp transportation in the city. And it's very wide encompassing. They hope to be done by 2030, but in the context of global pandemic, their website is already out of date. Most of their programs haven't been updated since 2019. Many of them still say that they're in the planning phase. They haven't even been implemented. And aside from all that, when you look at project descriptions, you see a lot of the same. It's seaport, ferry service, downtown, seaport. You're not really seeing neighborhoods like Roxbury and Dorchester that are looking more for that kind of revamping of the transit system that's so desperately needed. So 
the point of this project was for us to conduct research within the seven different injury areas so that we could then compile this evidence to showcase the harms that have been carried against carried out against Boston's Black residents. Um, throughout our research, as you've seen, we've noticed an intersectionality between each of the seven injury areas. We've noticed that each and every one of them has a sort of domino effect on one another. For example, as Sam showed us, access to housing or the lack thereof can affect a Black household's ability to attain wealth. Um, each of us provided recommendations that we found from various organizations, such as the Boston Area Research Init Initiative, also known as BARI, or other ones that we may have come up with on our own. However, we do still recognize that Boston's efforts will have to extend beyond these recommendations, and it will most likely have to conduct a systematic review of its legislative decisions that have failed to promote equity. We also wanna acknowledge the discrepancies in the use of the term reparations and what it means. Um, we've seen some cities that have started the reparations process, as mentioned earlier, Evanston, Illinois, who did receive a lot of backlash for using the term reparations as the efforts didn't match the criteria of what many individuals believe reparations should consist of. We recognize the debate over whether the term reparations should even be used or whether they should be called investments, for example, or whether reparations should just be capital or should be, go should be going beyond that and so on. Um, at the end of the day, we do hope that our research can help Boston to create a reparations committee so that they can start their own process towards redress. Um, and I think that's it. So thank you very much for listening. And if you guys have any questions, let us know. We thank uh, the team uh, that has done this work for King Boston. Um, We've been on reparations for a couple of weeks now, and it's clear that uh, the intersectionality issues alone um, add to the complexity of uh, developing strategies to move forward. Um, there are several groups that are working within Boston at this point to uh, try to develop some recommendations, some very specific recommendations for the new mayor. Let's get back to our um, larger conversation as well. Um, my thanks to April and to the team for uh, the work that you've done and for the presentation, which helps us to um, wrap up um, a, a part of our uh, larger conversation about um, how one goes about achieving a sense of equity and fairness. Um, so I know Don's got a question uh, that I want to uh, uh, have him uh, ask, but as we're coming out of this, let me ask you, Joanna, being a political journalist, okay, not your moral belief or whatever, as a political journalist, can this pass? Can this be sold to people? Or is it one of those ideas that kind of is aspirational, but in the end um, will never go anywhere? I think the power of a presentation like that, like this, is, is in the specificity. And I do think that... Um, both on a, a larger political level and on an interpersonal level when you're sort of having discussions uh, with, with people in your own family or people in your own community, to be able to get past slogans and actually talk about specifics, to be able to show data points, you know, that, that, that $8 number, which, uh, which, which was featured widely in a, in a Globe story about race in Boston a few years ago, is such a compelling figure. And when you, you know, someone who, who is coming to this issue fresh can hear a, a dollar figure like that and understand the issue on a completely different level. So I think, I think the more that research like this can be brought into the debate, the, the more fruitful the conversation will be. Um, I, you know, I do think, and, and, and the presenters acknowledge, there is, and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, sometimes, again, be, because of the way everyone's sort of polarized and because everyone's so caught up in slogans and and you know bumper stickers and catchphrases that sometimes the very term can be a barrier and so i think it really is interesting to think about framing it as something framing it as as a as as equity policies or as investments as they said might actually get past this built-in barrier that people have because they come to a term with a whole bunch of preconceptions that probably aren't true, but that, that, that set up a blockade. Uh, Don, did you uh, have a question? Yes, I have a question for you. Thank you again for taking your time. Uh, 
this evening. I want to go back to something you said earlier about the Democratic Party and the squad. So uh, my personal opinion, I feel like the Democratic Party got a, a message problem. Like, you know, even like, you know, even um, in the last presidential election, most people probably vote for Biden is because we want to get rid of Trump, not because of the message, because the message is it's all over. Even why now you're like, OK, I vote for I vote for because of environment or whatever. So like, and I still feel like the Republican, so they got a couple key points. And even a five-year-old, that Republican can tell you what they are. Democrat, so I think we're all over the place. Uh, I finally f think like the squad is the only group in that party that actually can articulate and can relate to people. But unfortunately, um, some member of the Democratic Party themselves so kind of like vilify them um, because their message is too to the left or like whatnot. So in your opinion, or probably like from, from people you talk with, so how can, how can the, the Democratic Party become more, um, as they call themselves, um, like a big, tent, a big tent? How they can have a message that's probably more narrow and everybody can get behind it? I think your observation is very astute. Uh, I think there are a lot of political consultants in Washington and beyond who are working very hard on it, <laughs> who are really trying to crack that nut, because I think that is, that is a key, key question. You're right, um, in terms of de the Democrats being able to find success. It is true that the Republicans have been traditionally, recently, I mean, in the past 20, 30 years, much more, m much better at encapsulating ideas in, in you know, sharp slogan form that is that 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 people remember. I mean, drill, baby, drill. Uh, uh, um, lock her up. Like you know, you get you get this kind of catchphrase thing, and and I think that the I, I think it, it's it's partly baked into the nature of the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party is is. Uh, much more heterogeneous. It's much less homogenous. It's mu it's a, it's a it's a big tent in every sense, and so there are many more constituencies who are you know bringing input into any kind of uh, policy proposal, any kind of platform. They're bringing input into any kind of messaging, and anyone who's tried to make a decision by committee understands how hard it is to come up with something that's not a little garbled because everyone has an, has has a perspective and wants a piece of it. So I think in some ways. That challenge is baked into the the structure or the composition of the party. The Republican Party is just demographically more homogenous. I think it's easier to come up with something everybody agrees with when everyone looks uh, a lot more like you. Yeah, you know, even um, when we uh, look at reparations, for example, one of the points that uh, uh, the uh, researchers here made was that uh, there's been pushback in a number of these communities um, against reparations as it's being implemented, a lot of that pushback has come from black residents of the communities. Uh, it's not all uh, pushback coming from white taxpayers. So in Evanston, for example, um, uh, black residents have complained that only giving uh, housing assistance to 18 people uh, doesn't really begin to address uh, all of the issues that need to be addressed, um, and uh, a step that was intended to be a start uh, is now finding itself being undermined, in effect, by some of the very people it was intended to benefit. Um, so as long as there are that many multiple voices, the brand gets diluted, uh, and, and the message is diluted in a way that uh, undermines it. Yeah, I, I would add to that that, you know, Nothing is destined. I, I think you know we, we have to give the Republicans credit. They actually, maybe not demographically, are not a big tent, but ideologically, they they are. And it's striking to me how evangelicals have managed to make their peace with Donald Trump, a notorious vulgarian and womanizer, because they wanted judges appointed. Um, big business owners, conventional Republicans were able to build connections with populist, working class people, families who they actually laid off uh, by their economic policies, and yet find a common language to push them forward. I think that we're, we're not giving the Republicans credit, not just for messaging, but for modulating and compromising. 
I mean, if you read some of the, I mean, it's fascinating. I mean, the abortion issue, I think, will be studied for generations, um, in part for the way, you know, Roe versus Wade was passed and Democrats gave up, didn't really pay attention, thought it would never change. And the Republicans not only were persistent, but they built coalitions. They found ways to kind of, you know, make their peace with various people. So I, th I was struck by the presentation, which I thought was fascinating. But then at the end, I admired the way the researchers basically said, you know, but maybe we won't call it reparations. Maybe we should call it something else. And when we had our 15-minute political advisory um, uh, 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 poetry slam, one of the things that was interesting, I thought, was this discussion of free transportation. And that can be framed as reparations. But the suggestion uh, many of you came up with was, well, make it uh, something that uh, uh, poor people can use in certain bus lines, and also give bus passes to everybody over 55 and good parking spaces. So suddenly you've created a coalition of people over 55, poor people, African Americans, and that begins to feel like the Democratic Party. We have to remember the Democratic Party for many years was made up of Southern segregationists, and black voters in the North, and you know Jewish liberals and unions. It was imperfect, and we now, of course, know and acknowledge a lot of its limitations, but they got some things done. And so I think that you know, the final point, and this is something I think which is coming up more and more, there's a, we're very, living in Boston, it's very easy for us to look down on people who live in red states and rural areas. They're narrow-minded, they've never had good Thai food, you know, whatever, they're, you know, they're not the future of America. But I think more and more thinking is going on that we're just as isolated in our bubble. You know, we're in a metro area. You know, we don't meet anybody who ever voted for Donald Trump, except maybe when we go home for Thanksgiving. Um, we look down on non-college educated white voters. We don't take them seriously in New Orleans or elsewhere. And, you know, we may also, we may be paying the price for that is that our inability to relate, and Democratic politicians' inability to relate to uh, voters that are voting Republican um, may really be hurting them long term, because we're living in a bubble, in a bubble too. Yeah, and, you know, in, in the uh, presentation on reparations, uh, we see that embedded as well. Uh, we've had a lot of conversations that I've been a part of um, uh, within the university about the role of artists and the role of the arts um, and how we ought to uh, make more space and provide more subsidy and, and more um, uh, support uh, for the arts community. Well, uh, many of us have been very supportive of that. I worked on artist housing 30 years ago. But then you have to ask yourself, why artists? Why not plumbers? Why not furniture makers? Why not other people who contribute to the stability and future uh, of building up a community from within? Uh, why not teachers, for that matter? Um, and, and if we end up privileging one group over another, that, that process of privileging reflects our own internal values. And so then we do have to ask ourselves, what is fair? And if we're going to provide some sort of recompense for those who have been disadvantaged or underprivileged for generations or centuries, how do we select the people who should be prioritized? Um, may, may I add something to the conversation here? Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Um, first, I just want to thank everyone for their insightful questions and comments around this topic. Um, but I also want to dispel with um, a pretty common misconception that's important to know. And um, one is that, you know, and of course, we can certainly use more, at least in my opinion, um, progressive policies and, and the kinds of policies where, you know, we're, we're, we're able to sort of lift all boats, so to speak. But um, one common misconception is that, um, you know, sort of run-of-the-mill or sort of traditional public policy can be sort of packaged as reparations or, you know, oh, because um, black folks or African Americans are included in this policy that we can still call that reparations. Um, that, that's actually not true. 
And, and, and another important um, point to get across is that, you know, reparations is not um, just something that should live in the wheelhouse of black folks or African Americans. Um, so while we recognize that this work must be targeted um, to, to, the, to the gentleman that made this point, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's critical that we actually build a multiracial coalition um, around this issue. And I'll add that, you know, related to that point, reparations for, um, for groups that have been injured due to their group identity are certainly not new to this country. Um, a, a lot of people don't know that um, when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, um, President Lincoln had also um, uh, um, signed off on a law that basically awarded reparations to the owners of slaves who were loyal to the Union for their loss of their, um, their uh, chattel or their property. Um, certainly, the United States has contributed millions of Deutsche to, to the reparative effort um, alongside Germany to, um, to uh, um, atone for the harms against the Jewish community um, in the Holocaust. Um, certainly, um, our Japanese brothers and sisters have been awarded reparations for their suffering and um, isolation and internment camps. So this is not new. And, and in fact, some of those same communities have rallied around um, the reparative effort for um, black folks in America that's underway right now. We have friends here in the city and more broadly Jewish organizations nationally that are supporting us, um, Japanese organizations and groups that are supporting us in this effort. So a, multi a multiracial coalition is absolutely um, indispensable to push this through. Then I'll also add that King Boston has been tracking um, uh, uh, bills across 50 states and of course at the federal level um, that specifically have the language reparations for slavery in them. And in this analysis, there was a huge spike in um, bills using this exact language across dozens of states. We also know, for example, that H.R. 40, which is a federal reparations bill to establish a commission to both study the issue and recommend a form of redress, that made it out of the, co out, out of the Judicial Committee and the House for the very first time this year in April. Um, so this is definitely a moment that we're in. We're seeing traction, but um, again, it's important to kind of um, keep momentum around these smaller local efforts up because that in turn bolsters the kind of attention and momentum that we're going to need to pass H.R. 40. Because truly only the federal government has the coffers to really um, pay out um, the, the full redress or repair that's warranted for um, what's essentially, as the United Nations has put it, the crime of uh, slavery in this country. Um, so I just kind of wanted to add that there for some additional context. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you. Yep. Uh, I just want to ask a follow-up question to what um, April just mentioned. Um, why do you think that for black folks, whenever it comes to issues such as these, we're always asked to be inclusive or to build coalitions? Or in other words, why is the rest of America so reluctant um, to the idea of reparations to descendants of slaves in particular? Um, whereas whenever it's a question of reparations or retribution for other groups, um, it's, it goes through you know, the state, federal government, whatever, wherever it is going through. Um, why, is, why are we so reluctant when it comes to black people specifically? April, do you want wow. to uh, talk about that? Sure. Sure, thank you. Um, excellent question. Um, really powerful point that you made there. And, um, you know, I don't have specific answers around that, although I, I, I see exactly what you're talking about. Um, what you describe is very palpable as we move through these different spaces and advocate for these um, policies. Um, but the reality is we still... Um, you know, nevertheless, have to kind of push through and, and, and move forward. And, 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 you know, our position is that a multiracial co coalition, um, for, for what it's worth, um, is going to need to be a part of that if we're to see meaningful traction. Um, to your point, you know, I think it is, um, you know, sad that, that that's kind of the experience in moving through this work, but it's the reality that we're functioning in. Um, and we are nevertheless grateful to have... Um, you know, um, groups in the Jewish community and in the Japanese community, as well as the, um, as well as just you know, white folks who um, who really see our position on the issue and are empathetic and are genuinely invested 
and helping seeing this through. Um, so we're, we're, we're glad to have them by our side, but we do recognize that, you know, um, it would be great if the country kind of just woke up and saw that this was the moral and the right thing to do, and that is consistent with things that we've done in the past. But um, unfortunately, this is kind of the, um, the lay of the land, so to speak, that, that, that we're working with. So thank you for that question. Really excellent point. I mean, if I could just add to that, I, I think part of the answer has to do with power. You know, people, no one likes giving up power. No one likes giving up uh, money, certainly. You know, Jews were, I mean, there was you know, huge amounts of anti-Semitism in the U.S. as well as internationally, and it took the Holocaust, probably, you know, the world's most uh, traumatic genocide, um, to kind of make people think that, well, okay, maybe, you know, there should be reparations there. Um, and I think that what the situation you have now is that, you know, as, as we've discussed, you know, whites don't like giving up privilege, they don't like giving up power. And so you can kind of confront that directly with a moral argument, which I think in a way might be the model of the Holocaust. But you know, if you look back at World War I, one of the big battles after World War I was how much in reparations Germany should pay to France and England for World War I. And the French were determined to basically extract you know, huge amounts of reparations from the Germans. The U.S. was more reluctant. It was a huge battle at Versailles. And in the end, the reparations were punishing against Germany. And there are various people who will argue that's part of what led to the rise of Nazism was the resentment on the part of many Germans that they were being forced to pay reparations to, um, to France and to Germany. So I, I, I think the argument is often around power now, if you're in a position where the victor can kind of expropriate or, um, or somehow uh, force uh, the, 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 the loser um, or the, the culpable person to pay reparations, that's been done historically. Um, if you're in a situation, as kind of April points out now, where politics is sort of the only, the only way to do it, and then I think storytelling journalism, media, as a way to get people to understand their moral obligations is maybe a way to push things forward. You know, Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement, part of their appeal was to white Americans, you're better than this, right? You know, this is something that will benefit all of America. Um, it was a political argument um, as much as a moral argument. And I, I think that's just the position you're in when you're, you're when there's a, a kind of a power imbalance, if you're going to stir people's consciences and make them partners, that's kind of the one path you have. I don't know, Ted, what your thoughts. Yeah, well, I would just add that that um, one element of the power imbalance um, is, is related to whether you view the reparations as a step forward or the restoration of something that was taken away and lost. So, for example, everyone could feel um, that Japanese Americans were entitled to some form of reparations because they, before the Second World War, they constituted um, uh, a viable economic entity. They were homeowners. Uh, they had communities. And much of that was taken away from them. Uh, and so mm -hmm. after the war, the sense was not so much that you were doing affirmative action for Japanese Americans, it's that you were restoring them to where they were uh, before uh, the losses. Um, and um, for many other groups that have uh, been able to achieve the status, a status of receiving reparations, there's more of a sense of restoration than a sense of, I'm going to advance these people beyond where they were before. So um, the, the sense of justice says that it's fair to restore. The sense of justice um, is sometimes viewed um, as being exceeded if you are giving people something that you don't think they had before. And historically in this country, um, we never really talked about the wealth that existed in places like Tulsa, Oklahoma. We never really talked about the wealth that existed in places like Wilmington, North Carolina, or even in Harlem. 
So um, we never really talked about reparations as being something that was restorative as much as we talk about it in a sense of making people feel guilty for slavery that they don't feel responsible for. And that's a mm -hmm. different sense when it comes to how you balance the scales of justice. I think that's, that's something that, beyond just this issue, is, is a challenge in political messaging and messaging across parties. I mean, if you, if you go to different regions, and in particular if you, if you look at different media that, that takes different perspectives, one thing, I, one thing I've always found is that there's a very, people have very different definitions of fairness. And fairness is something that motivates a lot of people, a sense of fairness. But what you, what, what you mean by fairness can be so different depending on your perspective, depending on what you're hearing. So when it comes to an issue like reparations, right, what, is, what is fair? Is, is, is fair bringing, helping people achieve things that the, that, that the system never you know, actively, actively fought against them achieving? Or is it taking something away from me and giving it to someone else who is, who, so, so this sense, I, I, think, I think some of the, the um, resistance to policies like this comes from people's sense that something is being given to someone else that they're not getting or taken away from them and given to someone else. And that is something that needs, to, maybe storytelling can help breach that, maybe, one do data can help breach that, but I feel like that's a barrier. Yeah, and I think that the, the timeline between uh, the hurt and the effort to restore makes a difference. Uh, was it fair to divide India and Pakistan along uh, religious lines? Well, it was new that the British were giving up the Commonwealth and you didn't have 50 years of, of uh, political back and forth. Was it fair to allocate uh, space in the Middle East for Israel? Well, it, it seemed like a fair return for what had just happened in the war. Um, but when you look back 150 years, or 200 years, or 400 years for slavery, the sense is the harm was so long ago uh, that the potential beneficiaries are so dispersed that it's no longer fair because you can't identify those individuals who in fact suffered the immediate harm, even though there are long-term effects and, 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 and deficits that emerge from that harm. I mean, the one thing I will say on a hopeful note is that I do think in the same way that, that me too has changed a conversation about the ground rules and about and, and a common understanding of, of of social dynamics and gender dynamics. I do see signs that there that that many institutions and in many in many places you're getting a, a a broader sense of the meaning of racial injustice and the injustices of the past. And you know, I, I was just on a spin through the South over the summer. I was taking my daughter and, and some of her friends on a college tour. And it was really fascinating to, to go on some college campuses in the South and see the active things that those campuses are doing to acknowledge um, the, you know, the, their, their own racial history, and in many cases, incredibly ugly racial history. The University of Virginia has this very moving and compelling memorial that tells the story of the people who built that campus and who worked on that campus is a, you know it, and and what happened to them and, and it's sort of uh, you know no holds barred and it's a it's a really powerful experience to go through that the university of south carolina has a new statue of the first black professor during reconstruction and so you know there and, 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 and many of these, you know, that, I think that, that statue went up in 2018. I, I think over the last five or ten years, I do think the language is changing. I do think statues are coming down, flag, Confederate flags are coming down. I do think we are, we are coming toward a different language to discuss these kinds of issues. I think we have time for one more question. No, and I think the whole question of, of empire um, is, 
uh, is significant. Oh, okay, sorry. The question was, it was really more a comment, which was, um, uh, Don was saying that he doesn't know of any former colony that has been given reparations by the, the colonizer. And so that, that seems to be kind of the pattern that, that you know, no one in a position of power, no country, is prepared to sort of look at what it did before and hand out reparations. Is that a, a fair? And I, and I think as, you know, I think we all recognize there's an international aspect to reparations as well that, that revolves around empire. And it, it, it does seem that in the end, a lot of these countries, if you look at a place like China, for example, which had, you know, has claims theoretically and practically not only against Western countries, but against Japan for its behavior during World War II, these things are kind of brought up, but it's almost a ritual. There's never, you know, a, a way in which these countries are paid for what they did. And that's why, kind of to Professor Landmark's point, in the end, what happens is countries decide to move forward, you know, because they're not, they're not able to repair the damage. The only way they can repair is by kind of moving forward and hoping that things grow over the wound and it heals and they can kind of move forward that way. Yeah, two quick uh, uh, closing comments for me. One is that, at least in the United States, the only examples I can think of that uh, reflect what you're saying about um, a colonizer, in effect, giving something back, um, is where museums have recently been repatriating um, artwork that was stolen from uh, countries or from groups, indigenous people. Um, and, uh, you know, that's the return of something that was originally someone else's, right? It's, uh, again, it's in the, in the nature of restoration more than reparation. Um, and many people look at that as, you know, small gestures, but the fact of the matter is um, they're cultural gestures and, and they have meaning in a long-term sense uh, because they're about how a, a, a culture feels about itself and its history and how uh, those are projected. Um, and uh, part of what a uh, number of us in, in the cultural field have been talking about is ways of building up that sense of, of cultural identity and strength uh, within. And then the last point I'll make about uh, reparations is that often when they're requested, they're requested in what feels to me at least like a post-colonial way. That is to say, you hurt me, give me something to compensate the, the hurt that I feel. And that's fine. But that's something from outside the community coming into the community to help the community feel better. And the question I always ask is, what is it that can be done within the community itself in terms of investing in itself with whatever outside resources may be available so that the strength does not come in the form of a gift so much as it comes in the form of an internally driven investment, as was the case in Tulsa, as was the case in Wilmington, North Carolina, as was the case in Harlem, where the people themselves build up their strengths and are not looking for someone outside the community to make up for a past harm. And I just have to feel, as a person who's doing and has been doing a lot of economic development, that we do need to use the term investment for a lot of what needs to be done at this moment because it's about building the internal strength of the community rather than getting a gift from outside of it that you always feel grateful for. One should not feel grateful for the strength that exists within a community that should be endemic within that community. Well, I want to thank uh, Joanna, April, and our student presenters um, for you know, a, a really provocative uh, series of comments, and I think a, a great uh, note to end our semester on. So thank you all. Thank you all very much.